I'm going to be talking about a very controversial topic as of late, all over social media, all over mainstream media, and that is all about Wegovi, Ozempic, Monjoro, also known as semaglutide or terzepatide. These are all GLP-1 agonists, and they are being used for type 2 diabetes and weight loss. And we are going to dig into it because I have been knee deep in the research, and I honestly think these drugs are absolute miracle drugs. So let's jump in. First of all, these drugs are getting a really bad rap, you guys. I don't know why. I don't know what's going on. I have my theories. I'll tell them to you later. But here's the deal. I recently polled my audience and asked them, hey, what questions do you have about these drugs? And the results were astounding. There were a lot of great, smart comments and questions, but oh my God, the ignorance around these drugs and the assumptions and the propagandized rhetoric that I was hearing over and over again was shocking to me. And I thought, oh my goodness, people have no idea how these drugs work. They have no idea how great they could be for the right person. I think they're life-saving drugs. I think they're amazing when done appropriately. And yet they're being so vilified. And what's even more shocking is that the functional medicine community is shitting all over them as well, which I thought of, of all people, that group would get behind this because they're not drugs, they're peptides. They're just strings of amino acids put together and they are peptides. Peptides are kind of hormonal-like substances and they're big in the bodybuilding community and the biohacking community. Peptides have been around for a long time. Peptides were getting really big in the regenerative medicine space when I left practice. So I didn't pay as much attention to them as I should have because I was on my way out. But I have been knee deep in the research, you guys. I have literally bought every continuing education course I could get my hands on, every certificate course, every book. I have been digging into all the peptides. And we're not going to talk about all of them today, but we are going to talk about semaglutide and terzepatide. So Wegovi and Ozempic are semaglutide and Monjuro is terzepatide. Terzepatide is sort of like the second generation of the semaglutide. There has been such a propagandized push to vilify these peptides and scare people away from them. And I truly do not understand it. I will explain to you why I think it's being done completely wrong in the allopathic community, because the way they're prescribing it is not ideal and it's not conducive to longevity, but used correctly, I do think these drugs are miracle drugs. And here's why I say this, there is long-term data and there have been studies going on for years. Plus, like I said, in the biohacking and bodybuilding community, they've been using them for a long time with great safety ratings. In all of these studies that have been done most recently in the past few years, what they keep seeing is shocking. These folks are losing, not only losing tremendous amounts of weight, which is what is reversing their diabetes. That's the thing, you guys. These are not like insulin dependent diabetics who need insulin and will die without their semaglutide. That's not how this works. These are simply weight reduction drugs. And the actual side effect of the weight reduction is a reversal of the diabetes. We'll get into more of that in a moment because fat cells in and of themselves are driving the whole process in my opinion. But these folks are also having tremendous impact in a positive way on their cardiovascular health, on their kidney health, on their liver health, on their pancreatic health, um, brain health, depression reversed, anti-inflammatory impacts, impacts on rheumatoid arthritis, positive, like really effective impacts on some of these debilitating, horrific downstream effects that come when your metabolism's all screwed up. You guys know I beat the drum on getting your metabolic health in order, but some folks are so far gone that no matter if they do every single thing right that I preach, they still are gonna have a really difficult time getting it all tied together. My question is this, why are we using these very safe drugs? And yes, there are some side effects we'll cover, but why are we using these otherwise very safe drugs as a last ditch effort to bring back the type two diabetic from the brink, to bring back the morbidly obese person from the brink? Why are we waiting until people are so far gone? And you know, I've said this before, if you get diagnosed with type two diabetes, the chances are better than not that you have been rocking a busted metabolism for 10 to 15, maybe 20 years. So all the damage 
that that causes has been going on in a low grade fashion as you slowly acquired more weight around your midsection, as you slowly acquired high blood pressure, as you slowly acquired cardiovascular disease. And they have drugs for all of these, right? I've said it before, type two diabetes is incredibly profitable. It's an incredibly profitable process for big pharma because there's all these drugs to treat the side effects of a busted metabolic process. And so by the time someone gets diagnosed with type two diabetes, they have been so metabolically deranged that ugh, so much damage has been done already. And they didn't even know it. It was silently creeping up. It was first, it was the, maybe the high blood pressure. And then it was the statin. And then it was the metformin. And then it was, you know, drug upon drug upon drug to try to lower the blood sugars. That's really the going strategy has been, let's lower the blood sugars with metformin and we'll reverse the diabetes. But that doesn't work so well. Now I have a whole other theory about metformin. I am not against metformin. I think metformin is awesome for a variety of reasons, but that's something we're going to talk about today. The bottom line is, when these folks' obesity is reversed, when their fat cells are shrunk down and they lose the weight, all of these other comorbidities are going away. So that tells me what I've been preaching all along is right. The root cause, the true root cause of so many of these disease processes, these lifestyle-induced chronic disease processes, the insulin resistance that comes with it, heart disease that comes with it, the diabetes that it eventually comes down to is being driven by at the root cause level by the fat cell. The filling up of the adipocytes is driving these processes. That's not to say that thin people don't get metabolically busted because they do. But the problem in that group, and we call them the skinny fat or the tofi, a thin on the outside, fat on the inside, that group is actually just bone and fat. There's no muscle, right? I've talked at length about the importance of muscle. In the obese group, we've got the fat cells are full. And when fat cells fill up, they become pro-inflammatory. They, Your immune system rushes in. The immune system inside the fat cell becomes deranged. It's a whole process we won't get into right now. But when you reverse that process, all the other comorbidities improve. So... That really kind of blows the health at every size hypothesis out of the water. And I mean, no disrespect by any of this. It's just at the end of the day, we've got these chronic degenerative illnesses that are being driven by busted metabolic health, insulin resistance, you know, metabolic syndrome, prediabetes into diabetes, frank diabetes. I'm talking type two here for the sake of this entire podcast. I'm talking about type two here, unless I specifically say otherwise, uh, it's the fat cell. And the fat cell drives the process. So in a nutshell, in your brain, when you are dealing and struggling with obesity, there's sort of a feed forward mechanism and the fat cells themselves, they become deranged. They start signaling improperly. The brain itself stops hearing the signal correctly. The leptin and ghrelin, the adipokines that are being secreted, all of that messes up things very badly with your metabolism. It, it further deranges your metabolism. So it's harder to get back and come back from. And it has a feed forward mechanism in the brain, which induces downstream inflammation as well. So you've got local inflammation in the flat fat cell. You've got uh, downstream inflammation coming from the brain itself. And the whole thing turns into a hot mess. So if we have a drug that has pretty minor side effects, it's a peptide. Again, it's a peptide, you guys. If we have a peptide that has pretty minor side effects, why aren't we giving it to everybody who's struggling with even the lowest amount of metabolic derangement? Like, why isn't this first line? Because I have found paper after paper after paper showing GLP-1 agonists significantly reducing visceral fat, GLP-1 agonists significantly improving cardiovascular health literally regrowing heart tissue, growing neurons in the brain. I don't know of anything else that does that. There's very few drugs that we have or therapeutics that we have that regenerates neurons in the brain. It reduces inflammation in the brain. That's a huge, huge piece of this whole puzzle is neuroinflammation. I did a podcast some time back uh, with a dietitian and we talked about central sensitization as a pain, you know, it's a pain process and neuroinflammation and the downstream effects of that. So you can go back and listen to that. We'll link it up in the show notes. 
it's just wild to me. And the list goes on. I mean, I've got a whole list sitting in front of me that improvement after improvement, after improvement, after improvement. And my theory is this, these things are, I know you've heard some terrible horror stories. We'll talk about that, but these peptides are so darn safe and well-tolerated for the most part. And they would literally eradicate the need for all of these other medications that big pharma depends on. So that's my theory. My conspiracy theory here is that these, there is like an inside propaganda machine coming from other pharmaceutical companies against the manufacturer because all of these drugs are owned by the same company. And so for the most part, and so the companies that own Lipitor, the number one selling drug in America, the companies that own the high blood pressure medications, the companies that own all of these other fancy, expensive, complicated blood pressure medications, cardiovascular medications, all of the things that busted metabolic health causes downstream, these pharmaceutical manufacturers probably don't want everybody on a GLP-1 agonist because if 96%, well, I'm sorry, 94%, as of 2018, 94% of US adults were metabolically busted. I would say it's more like 96 to 98 now, because that was old data. If that many folks are headed down the pathway, we've big pharma who manufactures these other drugs are sitting on a gold mine, right? D diabetes is very profitable for them. We know when folks get an elevated waist circumference, a for women, it's 35 inches. For men, it's 40 inches. We know those are the red flag zones. Those are not just the, oh, I'm up to there. It's okay. Like that's when you should be like sounding the siren. We know when those, that waist circumference gets hit. Another way to look at this is the waist to height ratio. So your waist should be half of your height. I don't care how you measure your height, centimeters, meters, inches, doesn't matter. Your waist should be less than half of that. So whichever one you want to go on, that's the red flag for significant increased risk for type two diabetes down the line. We have the data on this. If that's the case, and most Americans are sitting in that boat, including children, the rates of diabetes doubled in 2020, type two diabetes doubled in 2020 due, due to lockdown. So if we've got this huge group of people sitting in this massive risk factor zone, and they're all headed down the same path, which is diabetes, type two diabetes, why would we hold out on something that could reverse the process for them? Do we wait until somebody has a heart attack before we give them high blood pressure medications? Do we wait until somebody has a stroke or a heart attack before we offer them statin drugs? No, those are pushed early. They're pushed prematurely in many cases. Do we wait until somebody goes into full liver cirrhosis from fatty liver before we offer them, you know, a drug? We don't have any drugs for that really, but you get my drift. Why are we then therefore vilifying folks who want to take this for weight loss when they are clearly headed down that path? 